Hi, I'm Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series devoted to interviewing pastors and professors from LFBI and across the Living Faith Fellowship. Each week we come together, talk about lots of different topics, uh, but one of the things that we like to do from time to time is address issues of false teaching uh, that we encounter as Christians in this world. And uh, we believe that it's the church's responsibility to uh, combat against heresy uh, when it rises up and it comes in conflict with a literal view of God's word and our faith-based position on who he is and his mission. And so with this in mind, the postscript is occasionally uh, taking time to concentrate on those figures and those characters in our contemporary world that are teaching things that we believe are counter to God's word. So Bart Ehrman is one of these men. And uh, Ehrman is an American New Testament scholar and textual critic who has written over 30 different books. Uh, these books have had an exceptional impact on seminary pedagogy and because of that, have had an impact on the scholars that these schools produce, um, namely pastors and, and teachers uh, that are learning uh, underneath the teaching of Ehrman. And this week, we're going to address some of Ehrman's ideas that he uh, puts forward. And to do that, uh, and to have that exchange, I've invited Pastor Alan Shelby, Dean of LFBI, uh, professor here as well, and pastor of Harvest Baptist Church in Blue Springs. And so with that, uh, Pastor Alan Shelby, good to have you here, man. Yeah, great to be with you. you. Are you starting to resent the fact that I bring you on here to to, to take on these topics? You know, I did initially, <laughs> but you know, then I remembered back. It was twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I had I was college and career pastor at the time, and I had someone in the class come to me say, "Look, I have this guy. He's you know he's a Christian, but he." Yeah, and and at that time, I don't remember what Ehrman had written uh, early on. Yeah, but he wrote something, and it's like you know, what do I tell this guy, and how do I deal with this? Mm. So, uh, so I, I think I'm I'm good with using whether it's N.T. Wright or Bart Ehrman or some of the other um, popular uh, heretics. I'm fine with using them as a metaphor for. All of the other ones that are out there. Yeah. And I think if we can look at Ehrman, who is uh, by New York Times standards mm -hmm. uh, immensely popular in the airports, <laughs> and he, he just sells a whole lot of books in the airports. Yeah. And if we can, you know, address him, then uh, probably that's a good thing. Yeah, I think so too. And, you know, working with college and, and young adult people myself, th this stuff does come up. And um, especially with the number of students we have in LFBI, I think it's just so important uh, for us to continue to uh, prepare them uh, to protect their ears against heresy, that they could spot it and recognize it anytime it pops up. And uh, obviously, you're, you're, you're always a fun conversation on the show as well. So let's start with just who he is. Who, who, who is Bart Ehrman? Where did he come from? And... Uh, you know, what's his story and, and how did he get to the position that he holds? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I want to say up front is that I, I actually, I do agree with those that say that if you have to step outside of the Bible in order to, uh, you know, and use another source of information in order to try and defend the Bible, then that's probably stepping out of line. And, mm -hmm. and actually, I do agree with that. But when you're dealing with apologetics— and you're trying to do the work, you know, of a Christian who is defending the faith that they know that they have, then that's a different issue. And you kind of have to be like the men of Issachar, and you have to understand the times. And mm -hmm. the, the only way we understand the times is understanding the people, the characters, the stars mm -hmm. who are giving voice to the spirit of those times that we need to try and contradict. So, you know, there are a lot of ways I think we could simply open, open, open our Bible and disagree with Bart Ehrman. Right. At any number of a million points. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't want to disagree with Bart Ehrman. I want to show you how he's wrong. Right. So how did he get to the spot that he's at? And let me, uh, let me frame it in a biblical context, because in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul starts listing characteristics of the last days. Now, these are the last days for Timothy. 
In other words, the last days of the church age. Mm -hmm. And in verse 15, he says, evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. Yeah. So two classes, two categories. We've seen evil men um, in Buffalo, in uh, Uvalde, Texas, and other places. So we're seeing that kind of wax worse and worse. Right. We see seducers and... Bart Ehrman would fit into that category because in order to have heresy, you have to start with Christianity. Otherwise, it's mm. simply a false religion. Mm -hmm. In Bart Ehrman's case, he was born into Episcopalian family. Now, that means that he would have been baptized as an infant and kind of grown up with that type of catechism. But when he was in his high school, there was a group that was meeting and they were meeting in his school, and uh, you know they were a Christian group. Yeah, he started youth, going youth for to Christ, that. I think. Yeah, and uh, you know he he says that that they made him feel welcome. They made mm -hmm. him feel a part. He felt like he was connected. So he um, allegedly became an evangelical, and and kind of like a apologetics evangelist even, mm -hmm. and uh, was was kind of known for that and known for his um, debate prowess. And so he went to Moody Bible Institute. So uh, what he would characterize, I think, as a fundamentalist uh, yeah. educational institution. And after that, went to several other academic uh, institutions. Wheaton on to Princeton, encountering all sorts of skeptical uncertainty, and that caused him to question uh, and eventually reject the worldview that he had been taught at Moody and other places. And uh, so at the moment, he says, a moment of enlightenment for him was uh, when he learned New Testament Greek. Mm -hmm. So as he learned Greek, then he got very interested in trying to do what everybody except us is doing. Right. And that is to reconstruct a vanished original. Mm -hmm. um, everyone else except the King James translators, well, actually, all of the Bible versions to King James, and then skipping down to us, everybody else tries to reconstruct an original. And that's not what the Reformation text was about. It's not what Erasmus was about. That's not what the Texas Receptus was about. That was not what the translators of the other English translations yeah. up to the King James, they were not trying to reconstruct an original. That was long gone. They were exercising faith in what God had given. Mm -hmm. Ehrman, uh, Bart Ehrman, goes to try to reconstruct the original, and uh, so he figures out that it's like, well, if God didn't preserve a text, how can I say it's an—I mean, he's just being intellectually honest. How can I say it's an errant? How can I say it's really the Word of God? Right. And so he started viewing the Bible through the same skeptical glasses as his professor's at all of the different aspects. Mm -hmm. So not just textual criticism, which is his uh, specialty, his area of specialty, but also in terms of form criticism, which is where did where did that original writing come from? Mm -hmm. where did where did the human author get the idea? So obviously God's boxed out, the Holy Spirit's boxed out. Supernatural events are boxed out. Right. And all he's looking at are the same thing that the scientists look at when they talk about evolution. Yeah. It's not the all the complete data, it's not all the facts, but it is the conclusion that there number one, there can't be a God. And yet we are here. So if there's not a God and yet we're here, here's how it must have happened. Right. Uh, and coming up with that. So a lot of his career has been devoted to providing an unorthodox thesis about orthodox faith. And that thesis, which runs through, I think, almost all of his books, mm -hmm. is that um, church history has been wrong to say that um, it was the heretics like Marcion who were responsible for tampering with the text of the Bible. Rather, those who professed faith in Christ sought to change the Scripture in order to force it to adapt to, to their beliefs because they were in power and they were in the majority, and so they're going to foist that on everybody else. And so 
Christian faith, he would say, prior to the Council of Nicaea. So if you've had church history, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, a dividing point there. Um, Pre-Nicaea, 325 AD, and post-Nicaea. But prior to that, he would say Christianity ver was variegated. So they're all different, multifaceted. It had not gelled into an actual faith. Right. And there were differing Christianities. Mm -hmm. And uh, one was not necessarily more true than the other, but, but one of them won out. And since history is written by the victors, then they called themselves Orthodox. But really, that doesn't mean the others are heretics. It mm -hmm. just means that, that they, they differed. Right. And uh, so that, you know, that's kind of what's come down to us with Bart Ehrman. I think, uh, you know, if I just try and do an overarching critique of, of what we're going to see in this episode with Bart Ehrman, mm -hmm. it is that um, science is kind of a collation of facts based on your limited and fallible human observation on your experience on your senses interaction with those objects but that's not truth mm -hmm. now we use the scientific method in the world in a worldly setting to try and get at truth but that in itself is not truth truth is outside of our experience our our opinion of it uh, and truth comes from someplace else. And so the devil knows that, you know, uh, the, the, the devil knows more facts than the Scholars Guild ever came up with. Mm -hmm. And yet he's still a liar. So you only find true truth from the Spirit of God in the Word of God and comparing Scripture with Scripture. And there are a number of the popular um, popular academics who are writing on a popular level. Elaine uh, Pagels is another one. Mm. And she likewise has a tale of a conversion experience to Billy Graham, actually Billy Graham crusade, and then coming out and writing all this other stuff as she got her education later on. So what they both have is a rationality-driven emotion, emotional reaction mm -hmm. uh, to what is true according to the Bible. Right. And I think in that way, I think the deconstructionists probably re really relate to these types of figures because in most of those cases, you have individuals who've had some sort of experience with Christ. Maybe it's a, they, they came to a saving faith or not, made, made, made a profession, uh, had a moment of emotion or passion as it concerned the cross and what Christ did for them. And they have an experience you know, a conversion experience. And then they encounter another bias that comes in conflict with it. And then they spend the rest of their life trying to undo uh, the thing that came to them first, right? Right. That first authentic experience that is now the bias. And they've come into the right. This is a common story over and over and over again. Yeah. So Rob Bell, um, uh, Bruce McLaren, um, uh, Andy Stanley, mm -hmm. uh, all of them are overreacting against their fundamentalist upbringing. Right. In, in the things that, you know, the skepticism that they uh, bleed forth into the regular uh, evangelical community. Yeah. So in preparation for this interview, um, I read a book and, and you also read uh, Jesus Apocalyptic Prophet of the New Millennium, uh, one of Ehrman's more popular writings. And uh, I also listened to several lectures and, and, and listened to him on some podcasts and things like that, because I wanted to get a, you know, a round view of who he was and what he taught. And I do believe that this book represents a lot of his different thoughts. Uh, he captures them here. And in Jesus' Apocalyptic Prophet, he presents many of the, the most common ideas that are in you know, all of his writings. But one of the very first ideas that Ehrman proposes in the book is that the Gospels are essentially oral mythology, okay? And that, he, in fact, he, he likens them to the game of telephone, you know, the game that you play as a kid where you sit in a circle and someone starts with something that seems factual or, or is the true source. And then as, it, as that thing is whispered into someone else's ear and it makes its way around the circle and it gets, gets to, to that original person, it's taken on a whole new life. And so he likens the gospels to that. And he's convinced that Christ's followers uh, taught over several decades. And, and over time, the, the facts were diminished. 
and they became more and more disjointed. And he's convinced that the gospels, they weren't written by their namesakes and were instead written by anonymous authors that, that wrote decades and decades after Christ's life. And, and based on his view, the gospels are not objective in that way. And the authors are actually manipulating the text in order to match their own bias and the narrative uh, as it concerns the type of Christianity that they hold to. And so they're manipulating the stories in order to, to fit, you know, uh, what their community wants to believe. So now, so now right yeah. there from the get go, yeah, yeah, yeah. right there from the get go. Yeah. And uh, so if, I mean, if I'm going to, if we're going to do this podcast in such a way that someone else, regardless whether it's Bart Ehrman or somebody else, sure. they would know how to critique and how to, how to work with and what to do with it. Yeah. Um, the first thing I'm going to point out is that, and sometimes we talk about doctrines of demons. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's another thing, a characteristic of the la these last days. Um, you know that you're dealing with doctrines of demons when there's redefinition and um, faulty assumptions at the front end. Yeah. Because demons cannot do exegesis. So, so uh, you know, before you go on, let me just point out, from the front end, Bart Ehrman, without telling you his assumption, is going to run over you like a bulldozer. Yeah to try and cause you to take his assumption and then let him keep running with it. And his mm -hmm. assumption is the Bible came down to us through oral tradition. So it was an oral tradition that came down to us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he uses the illustration of the telephone and what you, know, what you do as a kid and whispering into one yeah. kid's ear and he whispers it down the line. Uh, okay, that may sometimes be true of um, whispered, um, things between kids. There is no documentary evidence that that is how the Bible came or was treated. Mm -hmm. So he's arguing from absolute science. He has absolutely zero evidence for that assumption. And yet that's his beginning assumption. Mm -hmm. It was oral traditions and and therefore, obviously, it was a method of evolution until it gelled over time. And that's not what we know from history. It's not what we know from the Bible itself. They were not oral traditions, yeah. and they were uh, uh, Jews uh, and subsequently Christians, true believers early on, were very strict with what was given and what was passed on. There's mm -hmm. nothing, even in the even if you took all the good manuscripts, all the bad manuscripts together. There is nothing that um, suggests the type of change that he's using with that illustration. It's just not there. Yeah. And yet it's a necessary presumption for him, for him yes. in order for him to dispel beliefs and traditions that Christians have held to for 2000 years. And so in order for him to undo what we believe, He's got to start there. He has to undermine things at the source. And I think we're going to expose that as, yeah. as we continue Genesis on. Genesis 3. Oh, yeah. yeah. Same story over and over again. Now, now because of these presumptions, Ehrman believes that the Gospels are obviously full of contradictions. That's, that's going to be his, also his natural you know, conclusion there. And they should not be taken at face value. So, so one of the evidences that he uses to convince his readers of this contradiction is the gospel of John. And so um, I'm, I'm going to present you with this and I want you to, to help us to understand it. So one of these contradictions, he points out several in the book, but one of these contradictions deals with Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and the time frame surrounding it. He says that John claims Jesus was executed after noon, the noon time, when the Passover lambs were sacrificed in the temple and yet Mark claims that he was executed the following morning after the lambs had been eaten. Okay. So the, the idea that Mark and John have two conflicting narratives in terms of the timeline of when Christ's crucifixion took place. So I, I want you to help us. How do you address a, an apparent contradiction like this? And what do you say about the differences, uh, and su supposed discrepancies between these gospel accounts and, and maybe any, even any of the gospel accounts. So, uh, you know, I don't think anybody's going to like this answer. 
uh, to start off with. Okay. What, I, what I'm going to give, because you are asking me to assume. Okay. As he does. Right. That there is a contradiction. Mm-hmm. So if the question is, how do I under- answer somebody with apparent contradictions? Yeah. If they're apparent. Which is why I use the word apparent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. Um, well, it would have been more helpful if he actually, in terms of examples he's giving mm-hmm. for his position, mm-hmm. if he had actually used apparent contradictions. So, you know, when I approached that particular paragraph where he talks about that, in his lead up to what he's going to say there, um, he's because he's arguing from the Passover and how the Passover was observed. And I, and I had to note his special pleading because he says, quote, according to the account still preserved in the book of Exodus, da-da-da. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, hold it. Wh- yeah. What? Yeah. Here's Bart Ehrman telling me but because because he's wanting to make a point to destroy uh, that will destroy my faith in the New Testament, mm-hmm. telling me that the account there in Exodus was actually preserved, right? And this is how we know that this other thing over here is a contradiction. Mm-hmm. So so first note that so he believed yeah. in the apparently in the historicity of Moses now, and this is fifteen hundred years before sixteen hundred years before. The, the uh, John wrote his gospel. Mm-hmm. So he believes in the historicity of Moses. He abli- believes in the accuracy of the plagues. He talks about that and of the Passover and the way it was passed on and how it's come out down to us today. Yeah. So it's accurate, but yet the gospels can't be. <laughs> and, uh, and not only, so not only is that false, mm-hmm. but... I'm sorry. I know that, you know, in an, a, a, a academic settings that, you know, they don't use this type of language, but Bart Ehrman is a liar. Mm. So let me quote him directly. We're told that this final meal took place before the festival of the Passover, John 13, 1. Now, may I read to you John 13, 1? Yeah, please. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. D- does that verse say anything about th- the meal or the festival? Yeah. Of, is that what verse 1 of John 13 says? No, no and in this, clearly not. Uh, you know, in this, Ehrman is no better than any of the cult groups, the Jehovah's Witnesses who do the same thing, or Mormons who will do the same thing, and devil did the same thing. Just try and fake you out, because they will say, well, the Bible says this, and give a verse reference. Mm-hmm. And actually, the Bible doesn't say what they say it says. Yeah. So he's, he. I mean, I'm just taking his words. I'm just going along with his argument, what he says. Is there a contradiction there? For John to tell me in chapter 13, verse 1, that before the feast of the Passover, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them to the end. That's what John 13, 1 says. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that, that's all that John 13, 1 says. Right. Verse 2 then skips all the way to after the Lord's Supper. I mean, it skips all the way to the end. So it's not like you're getting a chronological thing in John's gospel anyway. Right. And and so what what do I say to that apparent contradiction? I'd say, well, good luck. I mean, try and come up with an apparent contradiction next time. Because what you are saying is apparently contradictory in the chronology is not so. And I will admit that it it takes some study uh, to put everything together chronologically. Mm-hmm. But you you can't come just invent something out of thin air and say, well, verse one is saying that the final meal took place before Passover, because that is not what verse one is saying. Mm-hmm. So I there isn't a contradiction there. And yet, that is symptomatic 
of not only Bart Ehrman, but his ilk and others that our students or pastors, anybody else may run into. I mean, you got to check their references. And yeah. what you discover is demons cannot do exegesis. Yeah, this, this is a really interesting point because it's, it is easy. I think, you know, we live in, in kind of a world of convenience. And so when someone reads a book like this, it is easy to take it at face value. Uh, you know, the words that are being said without doing your homework and kind of function, you know, lazily as an academic yourself. And so you have to be careful when reading any book to do your due diligence to make sure that what people are saying is actually right, you know, is, is actually a, a fair hypothesis. And so Ehrman, uh, you know, a clearly, I, th I thought this was the easier of the examples. Um, no, but he, he, yeah, he, he presents have, several different. Yes, yes. And he does have, and so, okay, so what do I say about the supposed differences? Mm -hmm. uh, what I say is do your research. Right. Do your research. That's what I say. Now, so, so that's what I say, but what do I do? Well, what I do is simple English Bible exegesis. Mm -hmm. That is the research that I do. Because whatever else you do, you cannot accept a scholar's assumptions and characterizations. You have to think critically. You're, you have to check every fact. You have to look at every reference. Look at it in context. Look at it in light of other passages. Not in light of the spin they put upon it. Right. Do not let them get away with that. What do I mean about that? Well, I mean doing a close reading of the text. I mean getting the explanation out of the Word of God by that close reading. So that means you, you know, look at what the words actually say, mm -hmm. just like with John 13, 1. Uh, what do I, how do I address the contradictions? Well, look at what the words say. Look at how they're used. Look at what they mean, both by definition, uh, you know, by connotation and by denotation. Mm. Uh, look at what they mean by context. Look at what they mean in their usage in other places. Look at what phrases or clauses are key. Look at what cross-references shed light on the doctrinal context. Look at what Bible types shed light on what is being said. And look what rightly dividing the kingdoms sheds yeah. light on what is being said. All of those things... I'm going to say deals with every contradiction, alleged, supposed, apparent, that can be brought up. So, there, so what I'm arguing for then as a as what do I do with apparent contradictions? I'm arguing for a trajectory, not an answer, but for a trajectory. Mm. Study, teaching, preaching. Since context is, uh, since the words are the key, exegesis. So there's study. Since context is king, exposition, so there's teaching. Since truth has to be applied in life, exhortation, there's preaching. So exegesis, exposition, and exhortation mm -hmm. equals edification. Do that. Yeah. God's provided us his word. You know, it's, it's, it's not like we don't have access. It's not like this is, he's made it as easy as possible. It's not like... We don't have a, you know, a digital concordance and treasury yeah, yeah. of scripture knowledge where it, we can do what saints took hours and days and weeks right. to do before we can do in minutes. And yet so many of us are too lazy to do it. Yes. Which and, is in, and in saying that God's provided his word and study tools and all that is to say God has provided truth. So he's provided us the thing by which to critique apparent reality. Yeah to critique um, it, uh, our fallible human observation and our experiences and our emotion. He's provided us the rock, the truth. Mm. Use Start with that and use that to evaluate everything else. Yeah, that's good. Well, let's continue to do that because there's some stuff here worth evaluating. So one of the things that Ehrman says is that the similarities in the Gospels uh, can be accounted for because— Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular, John's always an enigma to them, but, but, but John as well, uh, in some way are an amalgamation of oral tradition uh, mingled with Gnostic teachings, right? That maybe even preexisted Christ, some of those Gnostic teachings, uh, as well as 
a Q source document, uh, a single document uh, by which the other authors simply referenced. And it's a, it's a hypothetical concept, right? They're assuming it's not any different than the assumption of the Big Bang. It's not any different than the assumption of, you know, uh, a single cell organism evolving into, you know, life as we know it. There are assumptions that they're using because they're convenient for them. In this case, in the critical text case, the Q source functions as that hypothetical idea that they can, it's that, it's that fifth party that they can reference, right? Because the, the four gospels aren't enough. Uh, what does the Q source say, which is basically what they've imagined uh, the, other, the other gospels were referencing? Yeah, because, so now since this is a mystery to most, most yeah. probably most of our audience, even most of our students, most of our pastors, because um, I know at least I don't spend any time uh, uh, discussing Q. Right. So, there's, so let me put it in context. There's textual criticism. Textual criticism deals with the manuscripts that are available to us that are in existence mm -hmm. and uh, trying and, and criticizing the text that has been preserved by taking those available manuscripts to try and reconstruct an original. Right. Okay. So that's textual criticism. Uh, but another area of the variegated and multivalent um, aspects of heresy and, and of uh, skepticism is form criticism. Mm -hmm. So textual criticism starts with the Greek text that we have available to us. Form criticism says, well, how did Mark's gospel come about? And, and Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel and where did, you know, how did those come about? Source criticism, what was their source to get it into the form and the format it's in today? So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are kind of formatted similarly. Uh, you can see them together, mm -hmm. synoptic gospels mm -hmm. and John is the outlier, like mm -hmm. you pointed out. Good reasons for that biblically, but that's that's a separate topic. Right. So instead, uh, what here's what here is what form criticism and source criticism says. They say, look, Mark being the shortest had to have been the earliest. Now they don't tell you their assumption up front is evolution. Mm-hmm. But that's why they say that. They'll just they'll just say that like they know what they're talking about. Right. Mark <laughs> was shortest. It was earliest. Then all of these oral traditions got added in later on. Mm -hmm. So Mark and Luke were later, or excuse me, Matthew and Luke were later after Mark. So where did Matthew and Luke get? the additional material not found in Mark's gospel, because mm -hmm. it sounds so true. And what they come up with is the doctrine of Q. Mm. They, they invent a guy named Q. Yeah. Now, they're in New Testament studies, they're simply, um, you know, they can't be outdone by the Old Testament study scholars who say that Moses did not author the first five books of the Bible, but four separate authors, which we only know them by their initials, mm. J, E, D, and P. Right. So in the New Testament, now again, that's totally fabricated, but it's a matter of source criticism and, and form criticism for the Old Testament. So in the New Testament, they invent Q. Mm-hmm. Q, and then they're so condescending enough to refer to the other texts as ML, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right, like, right, right. right. <laughs> Even though we know their full name. Right, yeah, yes. exactly. Bart Ehrman is a collator and a curator of other men and women's lies. And because he came from an evangelical background, he knows exactly how to bait the hook. Yeah. He knows exactly the best takedown. 
for um, believers who were like him yeah. that are out there. And that's that's exactly so, you know, back back in back in the day. Uh, they made up that lie about how the Old Testament evolved, J E D and P. Today, a group of unsaved scholars called the Jesus Seminar mm-hmm. uh, and others of their ilk create a document for which there has never been any documentary evidence. Yeah. So they say, well, you know, Matthew and Luke particularly, how do they agree? How can it be that the two of them agree? In all the stuff that Mark didn't say, well, there must have been another document. They wouldn't agree. I mean, obviously, they. I mean, these these documents were written hundreds of decades after the original events, and not even by the people who it says that they were written by. How is it that they agreed? Well, there must have been. Now we have no documentary evidence for it, mm-hmm. but there must have been this. This other doc. Now, let me ask you a question. In what other academic field could you create something imaginary and start studying that mythological monstrosity as if it were actually true and get people to pay you for doing that? Well, Well, wait, maybe evolutionary biology, but outside of that, you could not do that in any of the hard sciences. So this is not even a theory. It is a lie. Q is short for uh, uh, Kavella, and Kavella is a, is a noun referring to a literary source or the source from which a concept or a piece of information comes down to us. So in the, in the late 1900s, um, a guy named Maitland started using it. He was a legal historian. So I, I don't know, like critical race theory starts in, in, <laughs> in the legal area and then comes down into theology. Mm-hmm. And it's a German word, Kavella, which means a source. And it referred to like the spring the source of a river. And so for Ehrman, the Gospels preserve not some information about a historical Jesus, but many fictional stories which were uh, fabricated by early Christian communities and passed along with this ever-growing oral tradition. And whatever was committed to parchment at that time was Kavella, the spring from which the Gospels came about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not only that, you know, mingled in amongst this, we we can't forget that he's also making reference to the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas. These are also major players in his perspective. Yes. And why? Because they they are not unorthodox. They are not heresy. Yeah. They are competing orthodoxies. Right. To, to the one commonly accepted as being orthodox. And so, sure, you put the God, you know, why would you reject the Gnostic Gospels if you accept the true ones? Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, you know, if again, if, if you're not going to base biblical authority in what was actually preserved, then that's your Achilles heel. Yeah, for sure. So again, uh, you know, Ehrman's objective in Jesus' apocalyptic prophet uh, is to reconstruct a version of Christ and his personage that falls outside of traditional Christianity and to strip him of his divinity and to take that away and to make him just another man, just another one of these first century messianic figures who came out as a, you know, as a particular, you know, there was political figures, there were rebellious figures, there were all kinds of different people that claimed to be the Messiah. He's just another one of those guys. And uh, he does this, you know, Ehrman does this by presenting ideas that question the reliability of the gospels themselves. And in the book, uh, he presents several different criteria. He has these criteria by which he measures the historical accuracy of any statement being made in the gospels. And one of these, and we're not going to present all of them because we don't have time, but the one that he he references quite a bit bit in the book and in his um, theories is the contextual credibility. 
which is the idea that if an account in the gospel doesn't hold up in light of what we know historically, okay, the, the facts that we have in, um, you know, historical scientific circles, anthropological circles, I, I suppose would probably be the clearest way of saying that. If, if the statements in the gospels don't hold up in light of those anthropological or historical ideas uh, of the time in which they were written, then they should be discounted completely. So they're thrown out. So one of the examples that Ehrman gives is that in John chapter nine, verse 22, we're told that there were, there were people that were afraid that if they confessed Christ and admitted publicly that they were followers of him, that they'd be put out of the synagogue. Now, in his words, he says, we have good reason for thinking that something of this sort did happen later on in the first century, but not during the days of Jesus. When, G uh, when Jewish leaders had not, in fact, passed this legislation concerning Jesus or his followers, it is likely then that the story, as narrated in the fourth gospel, is not historically accurate. In other words, what they're saying about being afraid of being put out of the synagogue, that can't be right because we don't have documentation that that was actually going on uh, during Christ's life. So what do you say about claims like this and ideas like contextual credibility uh, as methods of throwing out portions of, of Scripture. Okay, so I'm, now I'm going to reference Second Peter chapter 1 for anyone who wants to turn to it. Okay. I'm going to reference that Not in a minute driving, in terms of, of what, I, what I say about it. Yes, okay. Um, but let me also lump in with his uh, contextual credibility. He, there's another thing he talks about, the criteria of dissimi dissimilarity. Yeah, dissimilarity, yep. Um, so now... If uh, you've taken our class on manuscript evidence, you know that one of the canons, one of the rules of doing textual criticism is that the reading that makes the least sense must have been original. Mm -hmm. Under right. the assumption no one would, you know, intentionally screw it up. So the one that makes the least sense well, that must have been the original. Right. Um, Ehrman takes that idea from textual criticism and works it now into what we are talking about here with kind of form and source and redaction criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, his criteria of dissimilarity says that um, a deed or saying of Jesus is less likely to be historical if it supports the kinds of things that we think early Christian, you know, and the things we believe now. Right. So it's more likely to actually be historical if it's kind of like the Gnostic Gospels mm -hmm. and the nonsense that's in there. Yeah. Because that uh, presumes that, that if we're still teaching it, if it's traditional, well, it must have been manipulated. Right. In order to, to hold its weight. So this is a particular sophistry that turns waking reality on its head and turns truth on its head. Mm -hmm. And is why some of the gospels, like Gospel of Judas, is, is able to make Judas a hero. And the other, he was the only one in yeah. on the conspiracy yeah. between him and Jesus, not the other disciples, not the other apostles. Mm -hmm. So you've got the criteria dissimilarity, and then you've got his uh, credibility, his contextual credibility, which would say that unless you see something in the Gospels echoed by actual historical documents and evidence we have right now, then it must be anachronistic. You, someone must have later on read that in there. So if we know later on that the rabbis started saying, look, there's a difference between Christians and Jews, and Christians can't be part of the synagogue. They are not Jewish, mm -hmm. even though they believe in this guy named Christ who was a Jew. So later on, Jews just start, did start saying that. So if you, you know, what he's asking you to, to believe is that he knows exactly what the rulers in Jerusalem were doing at the moment of the Gospels. And since they left no paper trail 
of putting people out of the synagogue. Mm -hmm. But we know it happened later. Well, that must have been read in from later, and this was added much, much later on. So, uh, so what I what do I say about a claim like that? I say look at it like any other conspiracy theorist, political or anti-Semitic. They mix two things because it takes two things to ensnare you. So, Second Peter one sixteen: For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Okay, all the great scientific and scholarly conspiracy theorists, all that they do is, is um, you know, after they claim to have done secret research that either nobody else knows or you and I can't understand. Right, right. Um, no one else can verify by observation their claim, so they just make a claim. Now, um, a fable is evolution. That's a fable, mm-hmm. um, a, a, fa- a fair kind of a fairy tale for grownups. A fable is uh, four undocumented documents, J, E, D, and P, to make up the Pentateuch. A fable is an undiscovered quella mm. as an original manuscript, which you can fabricate since we don't have the original manuscripts anyway. So a fable is fiction, not factual. You know, so here are two things that they mix. Number one, arguing for a fable that takes waking reality and turns it on the head, even though they might innocuously call it a a theory. Mm -hmm. And number two. That's how they get away with it. Yeah. They call it a theory and they treat it as Yeah, as they're educated guests and they're more educated than you, so it must be right. Right, yeah. Uh, and then secondly, uh, the second thing is what you described, just described in John chapter 9, verse 22, that somehow he knows what those Jews in Jerusalem were telling their synagogue leaders in the last year of Jesus' ministry. So that's a snare. Mm-hmm. I mean, just do those two things. Invest something, invent something that you say was, you know, uh, actually happened out of your own imagination. Just invent it and then present it as a factual thing and then deny somebody else the real basis uh, for uh, discovering what truth is. So basically, uh, you have divided by zero and obviously you can prove a negative. <laughs> Right? I mean, obviously, if we let Bart Ehrman divide by zero, then he can prove the negative that that never went, actually went on historically in Jerusalem, despite what John 9, verse right. 22 says. Yeah. I mean, how can we let uh, Ehrman or anybody else say definitively what the Jews could have jo- done? Apart, apart from the documentary evidence that we do have, which is the gospel. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think his book actually aids the case of the two upcoming fads in skeptical scholarship. J.M., Jesus Mysticism, mm. and um, H.J.A., Historical Jesus Agnosticism. And the Gospels portray neither of those. They describe the Messiah, Son of God. And mm-hmm. historicists and mythicists both posit a different form of Jesus who preached uh, a different gospel and preceded the gospel's version of Jesus. So they do academic acrobatics uh, to monetize their YouTube conspiracies in effect. Uh, because after all, he is published by Oxford University Press. Mm-hmm. From an apologetic standpoint, so let me go ahead and step outside of, you know, Second Peter chapter one, or outside the Bible for a second. Just if I were going to deal with Bart Ehrman mm-hmm. on the level of his own evidence and and his own words against him, um, the New Testament Gospels provide us with accurate information about geographical features of first century Palestine. They correctly name numerous cities and even small villages. They provide accurate depictions of Jewish religious customs. They name real historical, political, and religious figures. So I think it's worth comparing the accuracy of the four Gospels 
against the apocryphal gospels, which omit those kind of details entirely right. because they were written right. hundreds of years yeah. after the fact. And so the gospels were in fact written 40 to 70 years. Um, you know, uh, they were w written within the generation after the death of Christ. Yeah. And, and archaeologists have unearthed the Pool of Bethesda mentioned in John 5. The Pool of Siloam mentioned here in John 9, the synagogue at Capernaum where Jesus preached, Luke chapter 4, even the ossuary, the bone box of the high priest Caiaphas mentioned in Matthew 26. Yeah. Yeah. So the historicity of scripture is only proven time and time again, time and time and time and time again. And it's convenient. It's convenient for someone who wants to strip Christ of his divinity to undermine the only accurate documentation that we have of his existence. And that historians, whether Christian, whether, whether theological or not, have held to as airtight in their factual evidence of who Jesus is for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. I think all they are doing is giving voice to their own doubts. Mm -hmm. They're giving voice to their own skepticism and then spreading that around because it that makes them feel better to see that other people accept the same skeptic skeptical view of the Bible they have. Let's take a moment right here to hear from Pastor Mike Renault of Living Faith Boston. Hi, I'm Mike Renault, pastor at Living Faith in Boston, Massachusetts. And if you're considering learning the Word of God, Living Faith Bible Institute would be a good place for you. The good thing about LFBI is that you're not just learning from an academic standpoint. You're learning from actual practitioners that do, in fact, know the book. These are pastors and men who are leading churches, doing the work themselves, since they can give you a firsthand real life knowledge of what it means to learn the Bible in that context. Some of you may have a call in your life for the pastorate uh, to be a missionary, to serve the Lord in other parts of the world. Living Faith Bible Institute can prepare you in a way that you can be equipped with the Word of God and given practical tools, being held accountable in your ministry right where you're at. If you're interested in learning more or you want to enroll in LFBI, go to lfbi.org. In, in Ehrman's final analysis, so Christ did not teach that he was divine. Okay, regardless of what <laughs> we can read plainly on the pages, particularly in, in the Gospel of John. But he, but he says that Christ didn't teach that he was divine. He was simply one of many first century apocalypticists like John the Baptist and, and other figures of the time. And he was convinced, uh, Jesus was convinced that the end of the world and the rise of God's kingdom would happen in his lifetime. And, and Ehrman points out the flaws and the failures of Jesus by quoting Mark 9. Okay, so he abuses Mark 9 in order to make his point. It says, and he said unto them, Je uh, Jesus is speaking, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And so he uses this passage to suggest that Jesus was wrong in his prophetic statement, that, that the establishment of the kingdom, it didn't come, and, and Jesus' statements weren't true. So how do you respond to claims? Because this is a claim that people have made for a long time as it concerns the 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 statements of Christ as it concerns the kingdom, okay? And I think it's important for us as believers to understand what Scripture actually teaches as it concerns Christ and His kingdom. And what was Christ really saying here? So let me, um, le uh, so this is a shell game. Mm -hmm. Let me lift up the shells so that you know please, what please. Lord Urban is doing here. Yeah. Uh, because in this particular book, as you know from the title, and uh, uh, basically the thesis that he makes in this book, Jesus is not the Son of God. He was simply a prophet, but an apocalyptic prophet. He was a prophet predicting the apocalypse, and he was, pre he was predicting a judgment 
by the Son of God who would come, and he was a failed apocalyptic prophet because he predicted it would happen in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. And instead, he was crucified. Right. So Jesus is a failed apocalyptic prophet. Now, so that's a shell game Mm -hmm. of, you know, names and titles and... And okay, but if I lift up all three shells, one of them has a scorpion underneath. I didn't want that anyway, just just so we know. Mm-hmm. I did not want that anyway. So in the days before YouTube, um, Ehrman took advantage of that millennial change because this book, I think, was written in like 1999. Mm-hmm. So he's taking advantage of the year 2000 and all of the hullabaloo, yeah. you know, that was coming up over that. And he's reviving that theme that Jesus is an ap- apocalyptic a prophet. He expects himself to be delivered by the Son of Man, but he dies hopelessly with no one to aid him. So later, an anonymous but influential early church, their community erroneously confused and conflated the two and came up with the idea that Jesus himself was the Son of God. And without, um, quote, without critically analyzing their sources, the evangelists took this misidentification over into the Gospels, unquote. Mm. So that is key to understanding why Ehrman says Jesus was a failed apocalyptic prophet. So then, Mark chapter 9, verse 1, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now what, I I guess, again, just like where we were at with John chapter 13, what's the problem? Because there were some of them standing there. Okay, let me, answer, let me point out a couple of things, a couple of levels. There were some of them standing there who saw the kingdom of God come with power in Acts chapter 2. Mm-hmm. Secondly, since verse 1 is a prelude to verses 2, 3, and 4 of that chapter, and context is king. Then Christ's transfiguration on the mountain was also a picture of his second coming with power. I mean, it, 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 you know, that Mount of Transfiguration thing would have been a picture of his first going if he had accepted the offer to be teleported to heaven because the Father had spoken and he was pleased with Jesus. Third time is a charm right there. I mean, you're uh, okay, you can come up now. Mm-hmm. We don't have to go on with any of the rest of this mess, but, you know, Moses and Elijah were like, uh, we're kind of stuck here. Uh, we need to talk to you about the decease that you need to accomplish mm-hmm. at Jerusalem, Luke 9, verses 30 and 31. So it ends up being a picture of his second coming, not his fir- first going. Mm-hmm. So what we have here is the spiritual kingdom of God showing up in his physical form over the next three verses in that chapter. Mm. And third third thing, John, who was standing there, was teleported ahead and saw that kingdom coming yeah, and that king coming in power in the book of Revelation. So we've answered it on multiple levels. Mm-hmm. But, but now, if we look at Mark chapter 13, just, just one other key in which... Ehrman breaks the lock. He breaks the key in the lock, uh, which is also echoed in the other Gospels. Mark 13, verse 30. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be, be, be done. Mark 13 is the Olivet Discourse, we call. And so Jesus is answering his disciples' questions about signs of the times and the destruction of the temple. That leads Jesus into explaining the tribulation and the signs of the second coming. And again, what's the problem? The generation that sees the actual signs during the tribulation are also going to see Christ come. After all, it's only seven years long. Mm -hmm. And if they can endure to the end, they they will see him come. And it gets done within one single generation. So so you can cross-reference 
that particular discussion with our sister podcast, Theology Roundtable, and the discussion they've had of that very topic uh, yeah. back on uh, April 8th. Mm -hmm. And in both cases in Mark and in the other ones that Ehrman would list, his conclusions are based on false assumptions of, about the text. They are they demons cannot do exegesis, mm. so they do do not come out of the text, and um, you know that's that's why he thinks Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet that bless his heart died without seeing the apocalypse come about in his lifetime, and oh, isn't that kind of like every generation of Christians has been since then? And uh, he wants to take away your hope. To mm -hmm. take away the blessed hope. And you know what? The rapture is obviously my blessed hope. But the resurrection is kind of not, not to be snuffed at. No. I mean, that, I think that's kind of a blessed hope also. I, I know Spurgeon used to say, look, you know, I, I'd rather follow my Lord and be like him and go through death. I'm okay if I don't get if I get raptured or if I don't. But Ehrman wants to take all of that away from you by having you focus on the distrust of God's word. Mm, man. And so in, in, with that in mind, what kind of influence is a guy, like a lot of our listeners have not heard of Bart Ehrman. This, this guy's completely new to them. Uh, this podcast will be the first time they've ever heard his name. And yet they've probably at some point fallen under his influence um, or been influenced by someone influenced by Ehrman. Um, he's kind of a, you know, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon type, type person. Uh, seminaries all over, you know, Baptistic seminaries that, you know, are dispensational even, uh, you know, prescribe his books for their history classes and for their textual criticism classes. And, and he is respected even as an atheist. He is respected as a scholar and his stuff gets taught. So in what ways are we finding ourselves influenced by Bart Ehrman without even knowing it? So um, I think 20 years ago, the book that he had written that somebody drew to my attention mm -hmm. because uh, they were having a, a disciple being drawn away from the faith by it uh, was called Forged. Writing in the name of God, why the Bible's authors are not who we think they are. So he, he wrote that, tear down the Bible. He's written his book on apocalyptic Jesus being mm -hmm. a failure, tell, tear mm -hmm. down Jesus. I uh, wrote a book on competing Christianities and um, orthodoxies. And so he's a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, um, uh, he reveals which books in the New Testament were not passed down by, he claims to, which ones were actually not passed down by Jesus' disciples, but were forged by other hands, and why that centuries hidden scandal is far more significant than scholars are willing to admit. So, there, so again, it's idea of a conspiracy. Mm. So let me just say that, number one, I don't care about Bart Ehrman and what he says. But number two, I do care about the people he influences. I care about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if it, that influences any of our students, anybody's disciple, anyone you've won to the Lord, anyone you're trying to win to the Lord, I kind of care about that. I generally do not care about conspiracy theories mm -hmm. until it touches the flock, and then I'm like, okay, I guess I got to care about this one. Yeah. Uh, uh, he had a mid-faith crisis. He has discovered, uh, a de he has deconverted, he has um, deconstructed his evangelical faith. And, you know, the way, a reason I was sort of okay, you know, I'll, I, I guess I was excited. I mean, I wasn't at first, because who cares about Bart Ehrman? But mm -hmm. then I'm like, okay, um, I can see how we can use this, because he becomes a metaphor for all of the authors Lisa Gungor, T Tony and Bart Campolo, uh, mm -hmm. Cole uh, Morton, Joshua Harris. Mm -hmm. You know, Josh Harris wrote the book on kissing, dating, goodbye, and then he Chris kissed, kissed Christianity goodbye. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yet, yet somehow that hypocritical disingenuousness does not affect those who follow him today. 
I mean, they're they're okay with, you know, him having done that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so we've got uh, prominent evangelical authors, bloggers like James Prescott, podcasters like John Williamson, pastors like Brian McLaren, Rob Bell, Andy Stanley, uh, Dave Tomlinson. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would just draw the conclusion like this. If you have no active prayer life, you're always going to be in danger of leaving Jesus. Yeah. So, you know, and, and we understand knowledge of the Bible, but knowledge can only take you so far. If your heart is not established in grace and you don't, you know, you don't, aren't able to translate that into practical application. And it's not translatable, it's not translated unless uh, your spiritual life is so active that you're earnestly and desperately dependent on God in prayer. So I think these are all people who have monetized Christian doubt and monetized Christ, you know, skepticism. And so, uh, so those who do not totally deconvert like Bart Ehrman has done, reconstruct their faith onto the shifting, sandy foundation of liberal theological assumptions. Mm -hmm. Therefore, while they would say they kept their faith, they often end up in mystic-based faith. And and there are even otherwise good men like A.W. Tozier, who opened the door to that a generation ago. Uh, again, that's topic for another podcast. Yeah. But uh, he gave himself over completely to the skeptical. Bart Ehrman gave himself over completely to the skeptical side of Bible criticism. The bone he throws us is in his alleged defense of the historical Jesus, which he has to defend the historical Jesus so that he has something to criticize. Right. He realizes you can't get a throw that away without, you know, throwing the whole thing down the tube. Mm-hmm. And so he's a recovering fundamentalist, a deconstructed evangelical. And if you let the devil swing your pendulum like that, then that's where you end up. That's uh, an incredible warning, Alan. This has been, you know, one of our headier uh, episodes, I think, because there's just so much to talk about when you're deconstructing a deconstruction. You know, that's, that's, I guess that how that goes, it gets messy, but I, I'm really thankful for the homework that you did and the time that you spent with, with some of these teachings, uh, to give us some insight that we need, we need, uh, we need to be able to, to defend our faith and stand on truth in a, in a world that is um, bombarding us with, um, false teaching. And yeah. so Amen. thank you, Alan. I, yeah, I appreciate you a ton and I always enjoy hanging out with you. And we thank you too, uh, for hanging out with us and, and listening to this. And I know that you, if you didn't get a chance to take notes, you're probably going to want to listen again and take notes and, and, and come back to some of this stuff. This is one of those episodes that probably takes a couple listens before you can get it all down. But, uh, if you enjoy teaching like this and you are interested in, and really understanding uh, the the biblical version of Jesus Christ, who he was, his life, his character, uh, his sacrifice, uh, and what he means prophetically for his church, you should take Life of Christ uh, here at LFBI, which is a class that we offer uh, annually at LFBI, uh, and and, uh, you should check that out. But I do want to take a moment just to plug the class that... uh, Alan Shelby has committed to teaching this fall, and that is the life of Paul. In an episode, you know, a while ago, we talked about the problem with N.T. Wright. And so just as Bart Ehrman has given his life to undermining and and reframing who Christ is, uh, N.T. Wright has given his life to reframing Paul. And so Pastor Alan Shelby is going to be offering a a class on the life of Paul, and he's going to help us understand who the Apostle Paul was in light of what Scripture teaches. And so that's going to be an exciting class, and I want to make sure that I plug that now. But we love you. We're grateful for you. If you've got questions about the Bible Institute or anything related to Living Faith Fellowship, visit lfbi.org or lffellowship.com. We love you, and we will see you again next Monday. God bless.
Thanks for listening to The Postscript. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review in order to help other people find our podcast. If you value this show, please help us continue creating content by supporting Living Faith Bible Institute at lfbi.org support.